This is a precision analytical case study. So we're going to kind of go through uh, a report here and uh, the associated symptoms and demographics and such. Uh, we have other educational videos on our website, so do be aware that those are available on various topics. Uh, the particular patient that we're talking about here is 22 years old, uh, fairly heavy, so high BMI, and regularly cycling, although thinks she may have PCOS, to go along with high blood pressure and some fatigue, but probably the most notable symptoms being depression and anxiety. So we'll get into that side of things, maybe on the cortisol side. On the sex hormones, we want to focus in on the PCOS and what's going on there. So with PCOS, we would expect a couple of things. First of all, we would expect high levels of androgens, and you can see that DHEAS is well outside the reference range. Now, the free DHEA is going to metabolize to androstene dione, and that will then metabolize to these two abundant metabolites. And you can see there are lots of them. So we've got plenty of androgens. Even though testosterone is not outside the range high, uh, we've got a lot of androgens. So the second thing we would expect to see accompany this, not always, but sometimes, and in this case fairly extremely, is high levels of 5-alpha reductase activity. So you can see this is fairly high here, so we're favoring the alpha over the beta. So what that shows is there's a big preference for hormones to get pushed down the 5-alpha pathway rather than the 5-beta pathway. And we can see that in all three of these hormones, androstene dione, testosterone, and cortisol. So the cortisol alpha is a little bit hard to tell because they're both quite high, but if you move up here to testosterone, you can see the alpha metabolite of testosterone is way outside the reference range, whereas the beta metabolite is slightly outside the reference range. And on the androstene dione, you can see the same thing. This values about four times the reference range, whereas the beta metabolite is uh, just outside the reference range. So a lot of androgens, but then the androgens that we do have are becoming more androgenic because when you metabolize an androgen with 5-alpha reductase, you get a more potent androgen. So what does that mean? That means a lot of testosterone is going to get pushed to alpha DHT. Now beta DHT isn't androgenic at all, whereas alpha DHT is three times more potent than testosterone. So you might ask yourself, this is a really good question, why then isn't DHT elevated? It's right in the middle of the range. It's actually less elevated than is testosterone. DHT itself, as we measure it, is probably a fairly good indication of how much DHT is made by the liver, but a lot of the DHT is made within target tissues, which makes it a paracrine hormone, which means testosterone is pulled into a cell, whether that be a hair follicle, muscle, whatever tissue, and then it's converted to DHT, so now you've got a more potent androgen. It exerts its androgenic effect, but then before it's released from that cell, it's further metabolized and deactivated to androstane diol. So DHT itself doesn't really reflect what's going on at the tissue level with DHT. You have to look at the bigger picture. You want to look at how much testosterone you have. You want to look at the DHT metabolite, which in this case is very high. And you want to look at if we're favoring 5-alpha reductase. So when you have the mixture of fairly high levels of androgens to begin with and then very high levels of 5-alpha reductase, you're going to get likely a very androgenic effect. And we see this high 5-alpha reductase with cases of insulin resistance, uh, PCOS, and then you know can just be a genetic uh, predisposition to favor the alpha over the beta and people sometimes give saw palmetto because that will cut down that 5-alpha reductase and shift things back the other way. But this is likely contributing to a lot of this patient's symptoms. So if we move on to the estrogens and progesterone, what we see with the estrogens here is first we want to ask the question, you know, how much estrogen do we have? And for that we're pretty much looking at the primary estrogens, E1, E2, and E3. And in this patient, you know, we've got a lot of androgens and she's fairly heavy. There's a lot of aromatase in um, fat tissue. So we might expect this aromatization from the androgens to the estrogens to be quite high, but you can see she actually doesn't have a ton of estrogen. So she's on the lower side, so low for estrone, 
uh, in the normal range, but on the lower side for estradiol, and then lower for E3 as well. So it's a little bit low um, on the estrogens, which might be a little bit unexpected in this case. And then we're seeing how we metabolize that estrogen. So we can see that an, in normal estrogen metabolism, the 2-hydroxy is favored at about 71%. That's this protective pathway that creates the so-called good estrogen metabolite. And for her, she's slightly overproducing that at 75%, which is good. And she's underproducing this 16-hydroxy estrogen, which usually represents 22%, whereas she's only at around 15%. And then the 4-hydroxy estrogen is uh, slightly higher than normal, but pretty close to what it normally is. So we've got pretty favorable estrogen metabolism here. And then the methylation index, which looks at this conversion rate here from hydroxy to methoxy, which is another protective step, looks pretty good. So her metabolism actually looks pretty good. The estrogen's on the lower side. And then as we look at progesterone, we see something that's not uncommon in PCOS, and that is that the progesterone metabolites are on the lower side. Now, if she wasn't ovulating at all, you'd expect these results to be a little bit lower. So this likely is a result of an ovulation with a pretty poor uh, progesterone production following that. So you can see the weighted average here of these two metabolites of progesterone, both which parallel progesterone levels well, uh, is on the lower side. So yes, uh, we're probably ovulating here, but there may be a little bit of an estrogen dominance issue. Even though the estrogen is on the lower side, that's a pretty weak progesterone response. So if we move on to the cortisol, I'll remind you that we've got um, a lot of symptoms of anxiety, depression, those sorts of things in this patient apparently. Uh, and when you and th those track with or correlate to elevated levels of cortisol. So you can see with this patient, her overnight cortisol is not elevated. So we may not expect to see trouble staying asleep because of the cortisol. But the rest of the day, you know, she's very high for free cortisol here. So. Um, that's definitely something to consider with a patient who's got anxiety and depression issues. So uh, as always, we take the integration of the area under that curve, or essentially an aggregate of those four, and that gives you the daily total of free cortisol. And in that case, you can see she's a little bit elevated, but keep in mind that number is being drugged down quite a bit by this overnight sample, which is actually on the lower side. So during the day, she's got a lot of cortisol. She's very high. Uh, so HPA axis activity here uh, is pretty high. We've got high levels of DHEAS. We've got pretty high levels of free cortisol. And then you look at the total cortisol metabolites, and those are extremely high. So that's way outside the reference range. So we've got a very active HPA axis here. And usually when you see that cortisol clearance or cortisol metabolism high, and cortisol high, usually that's indicating that potentially this is a chronic type situation where the body has seen these high levels of cortisol over and over and over again, and it's really upregulated these metabolic steps to help process and get rid of all that excess cortisol. To make things worse, the cortisol cortisone shuttle favors cortisol as well and what that means is you know in the body in certain compartments in the kidney in the colon in the saliva gland the cortisol is deactivated to cortisone and then in the periphery it's reactivated in the fat cells muscle liver it's reactivated to the active cortisol and the balance of that relationship with this patient really favors the active form of cortisol, meaning the cortisol is spending more of its time in its active form. Uh, one of the reasons that the cortisol is deactivated to cortisone is because cortisol actually can act also as a mineral corticoid in terms of the issues of blood pressure. So that may also influence uh, the fact that this patient has high blood pressure. So you know, the pretty common theme here in terms of turned up HPA axis, high cortisol, and you'd expect that to present itself with symptoms related, and it looks like she's definitely got uh, issues related to that in terms of mood issues, but then, you know, potentially also uh, some of the uh, adiposity that's obviously going to be exacerbated by having chronically high levels of uh, 
cortisol. So I hope that's been helpful. And if you have questions on other uh, topics, feel free to peruse our video library.